Welcome back to a podcast on marketing. I'm your host, Jordan Ogren, and this is a podcast where we talk about marketing. First question, who are you and what do you do? I'm Dan Knowlton, co-founder of Knowlton, um, and we produce creative videos and run really creative social media ads to drive a trackable return on investment for our customers. Uh, and also the co-host of the Business Anchors podcast, which is a podcast that um, is where myself and my co-founder Lloyd sit down and talk about what it's like to grow a marketing agency. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I've seen a few clips on LinkedIn from that. seems like you guys have a lot of fun too while you're doing it, which is which is key to any sort of content is to have some fun, not just be so serious. Yeah. I mean, we're also brothers, so <laughs> we've got quite a good dynamic. We've known each other. I've been taking the mick out of each other for the last 30 years, so it's... <laughs> Yeah, it's fun to just sit down and have a chat and talk about how things are going. Yeah, I was waiting for when that would come. I didn't want to like jump it because I'm like, maybe it's his cousin or something. But uh, <laughs> I don't want to just put like, oh, you guys look alike or whatever. But that's really cool that you and your brother uh, can do that, can work at the same company, but also kind of create content, work in public together, which is really cool. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. <laughs> I speak to some people who are in family businesses and they don't get along or people say they'd never work with their siblings but for us it it seems to work work really well yeah nice nice yeah some people definitely i can imagine would have a struggle uh, working with their sister brother but um what is something in marketing or business that you're just obsessed with recently something that you just can't stop talking about looking up doing if it's something that's like an actual you know action is there anything that comes to mind for you tiktok <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i think I really see TikTok as uh, the place where attention is going to continue to shift. So us as an agency, we're putting a lot more attention into um, producing TikToks, understanding TikTok as, as a platform. Um, and I myself have got my own account and I've started testing and trying more different types of content and seeing what works. And um, that's certainly something that we're putting a lot more attention into hmm. recently. What was it for you? I mean, obviously TikTok's been around for a minute. I think it was like musically before, but like what was the the kind of push over the edge moment for you for TikTok? I think just seeing how um quickly people were moving to the platform and using it. Like there's been a few historically there's been a few times in my kind of marketing career when I've seen attention shift this much like uh back when snapchat came out and it completely changed the game when it comes to social platforms you know a social platform without a news feed where you swipe up down left right rather than scroll a news feed it was a big shift and lots of people kind of moved their attention to the platform and i felt a similar thing more recently in the last year or so with tiktok and mm. um i think uh, i guess one of the big kind of moments for me was when I started to properly use it it's amazing and scary how powerful the algorithm is in terms of keeping you on the platform and obviously as a marketer our whole uh, job is to captivate and hold an audience's attention long enough to sell them something ultimately mm -hmm. or to get them to do something so just seeing how many hours I was losing by using the app uh, <laughs> kind of made me think wow this is clever we need to understand this yeah, for real, for real. Yeah, there's this like uh, internal conflict for me as a marketer, where I have yet to download TikTok because I watched what it did to my wife. Not that like she's in some <laughs> mental asylum now uh, because of it, yeah. but just the fact of how addicted she is. And just there's this push and pull of like, you know, oh, everybody's jumping off the cliff. Well, I'm going to also jump off the cliff too and see where it takes me. I struggle with how to, how do I know like clubhouse was an example of something where mm. I was more inclined to get on and I mean, I invested two weeks at most, but like I was just hitting my head myself on the head. Cause I'm like, this was so stupid. Like it didn't turn into anything. Yeah. I, I really didn't like clubhouse. And I, th I think that the whole, um, I just think it's a very inefficient way to consume content. Like you have to, to gain value, you have to be there live when a room starts that, you know, there's no yeah. longevity of the content and no, yeah. Uh, my kind of thought process is if I want to listen to audio, which I do, I listen to a podcast because I can decide I want to listen to this conversation about this topic so I can learn that rather than 
you know, it's basically like watching live TV, but audio, and you just have to be there and switch it on. It's, yeah, I'm not right. a fan. Yeah, no, definitely. And that, that could have been too, like in the in, kind of early days, you could have used some of that thinking to be like, hey, because that's the, like marketers or, I mean, what you're talking about are these pivotal shifts. You know, there's only a few times Google, before Google was huge and people were pumping money into Google ads, like they're just winning because they're so early. It's buying that property that's on the beach that's not yet developed, that is going to be developed. And so many times us marketers can buy property that never gets developed, AK Clubhouse or some of those others. So I find there's a, how do you think through, I guess I was going to try to answer, but how do you think through which <laughs> platform to invest time and energy on and which ones to say, we'll wait? Good, good question. I, I just, just analyzing my behavior, I, I'm not the type of person to hear about something. It's just started and just jump on it and start an account and I think I'm the type of person that will like to sit back for a bit and see how things develop before, because otherwise I feel like I'd spend my whole life like jumping onto a thousand platforms a week and never actually gaining any traction. <laughs> I like to kind of watch and see how things are gaining traction and if it's something I feel we should be investing time in and then actually go for it. Um, so I could, yeah, how do I make the decision? Looking at uh, the growth of a platform and keep an, you know i i feel like i've got my kind of ear close to the ground to know what's going on in the marketing world um so just watching key sort of influential people and what they're doing to see if it's something that we should test hmm. yeah that's good because obviously there's probably a window of time where there is that opportunity to actually get in before it's quote unquote saturated. But even mm -hmm. that argument is flawed in the sense of like podcasts and some of these things that are so saturated, you can still start today uh, in a sense grow. It's just much harder. Yeah. I mean, like I even, so for example, we've really only gone all in on TikTok in the last six months or so. And we've had videos go viral and reach you know half a million or like semi-viral wow. nowadays reaching <laughs> half a million people and you know our pod our business anchors podcast that my brother and i do um we started that in february 2020 years after podcasting was a thing and now it's one of our biggest revenue generators in terms of attracting new business so i don't think you i get the argument you, you know being early you're very likely to win if you you choose the right platform but i think there's plenty of opportunity still on platforms that um there is an opportunity on. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Well said. Well said. So how do you, we're talking a lot about kind of platforms, a lot about maybe more tactical in a sense. Let's like take ourselves up in the air a bit. When you think about marketing, how do you define what it is? Like if, you know, we're using the jobs to be done framework, like what is the job marketing should get done in an organization? Good question. In its sim most simplistic form, I'd say marketing is the tool you use to get in front of and captivate your audience's attention long enough to get them to buy something. Or, like, you know, it's not always buying something, to get them to do something. Mm -hmm. um, that's the job of marketing. And I think we've really found that when you've got good marketing, it takes a lot of the kind of uh sales process away so for example us now because we're invest heavily invested in marketing you know we we're a marketing agency so we obviously believe that it's worth investing in we put a lot of resource into producing our podcast producing content producing a whole range of content and what that does is uh, allows us to have a completely inbound sort of inbound funnel of opportunities that come to us that are kind of pre-qualified that have already thought right i know what you do i trust you let's discuss how we can work together rather than us having to put all the legwork into going out and trying to um, speak to new customers. So yeah, it's the way that you captivate their attention long enough to convince them to do something. Hmm. Yeah, like that kind of the final do something because I think marketing is all about some sort of change, whether it's from I haven't been using a product to I'm using that product now or even just, you know, I'm going to start uh, thinking differently about food per se. If maybe you're a brand that sells something in the health, it's not always product base. And I, I really enjoy what you said just about the sales, maybe the sales kind of process is it supposed to or 
it's meant to help it in the sense that like there's so many statistics i'm not even going to use them of like 70 percent of the buying process is done before ever contacting mm. sales blah 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 but it's true that like if you aren't putting content out there about essentially not who you are but where I can grasp who you are, what do you do through the content? I'm going to find it elsewhere. So I find like marketing is really key on um, education and a lot of those things just to then have, like you said, that conversation be quicker, more efficient and more effective once they raise their hand and say, hey, I'm ready for X or I'm ready for Y. Exactly. And we're in a world now where the buyer has a lot of the power. They, they have access to all the information available. Whereas before, when there wasn't the internet, it was the sales guy or girl that um, had all the information on the product and that kind of thing. So, so now I think if you're not putting content in the places where your customers are searching for the answers, you're going to get left behind. And that's, that's the power of marketing nowadays. Yeah, no, I love that you pointed out that fundamental belief shift of where the power I want to just start playing that song like who's got the power but it's seriously <laughs> quite important to like understand like there has been a shift there still is a shift going on from this buyer power to a customer power I get to search I can buy an Instagram if I really want to all these kind of things that empower the customer. And if you just continually think in the same way of like we have the power, uh, your marketing is just going to be ineffective and you're not going to be meeting the buyer to your point where they are. So I think the the customer so that's that's, that's a really good point there. Um, just to kind of wrap it wrap around what is marketing because it is a very simplistic word but quite a complex mm -hmm. if you think about it what it really is in nature in a sense. Hmm. So so what is what is one of your strongest held beliefs around marketing like a hill in marketing that you are willing to die on and whether it's a <laughs> hill everybody's dying on or it's a hill that just you and a few people are what comes to mind for you So we've got this massive belief that marketing shouldn't be annoying I think as consumers we're getting more annoyed and frustrated when our experiences are being disrupted by marketing rather than adding to the experience. So for example, a lot of the campaigns we produce, we focus on producing kind of advertainment or entertaining advertising where instead of thinking of what our client's objectives are first, you know, driving sales and getting those key sales messages across, we, we, we kind of flip that on its head and think, who are we trying to convince to do something? What will they actually enjoy consuming? And then create content that starts with that mm. and then cleverly um throughout that has key sales messages and overcomes objections so yeah that that's that's our kind of main focus when it comes to marketing is producing marketing that people actually enjoy consuming rather than annoying them because i and i think it comes from a place where i've always been annoyed by people who are lazy with their marketing and try and just like cold call me and try and sell me something when i've shown no interest it's always been something that's quite frustrating or when people on linkedin connect and pitch you when they've made no effort to understand who you are what you do you know the amount of messages i get from other marketing companies saying we can help you with your marketing it's like you've literally made <laughs> no effort here so we want to be the opposite of that <laughs> yeah it's kind of um maybe you know a dichotomy of dollar shave club or their funny commercials in their sense mm. or just a quote-unquote infomercial where it's like hey we sell razors buy them like you can get where instead it's like let's make a fun ad where we're going through different places having some possible you know influencers quote unquote come into it just to make it something that like you'd actually want to watch regardless if you get anything from it um which i think yeah. is really important what if you would have to think like what gets in the way then of this so you're obviously on that side where you want to mm -hmm. make something creative something funny something that actually you know entertains per se like what gets in the way of companies? Is it, like you said, is it they're too focused on their objectives without making kind of a flip of like, what would that customer or the viewer want? Or what gets in the way of people doing what you're suggesting? I think it's any kind of change is scary. So traditionally, marketing has been heavily focused on the opposite of what we're talking about on, you know, we need to sell this pen. Let's tell them that this pen's on offer and all the benefits of this pen rather than what does that person actually care about and what can we create that they'll enjoy consuming so i think a lot of companies are scared of change um also i think uh because this is a very kind of different approach there's you know even we found pitching to brands um to to convince everyone is a challenge because 
a lot of the more creative concepts we develop are closer to the mark. They're not your bog standard corporate, hey, you can buy this thing. It's like witty and fun and entertaining and um, kind of tapping into relatable situations that that could poke fun at things or could, you know, that, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's it's scary for those companies to push boundaries because they're used to doing things a certain way. That's the main sort of pushback that we get when it comes to presenting these kind of concepts that we develop. Yeah, I can definitely imagine the initial pushback on some ideas. I haven't got through your entire library, but some of those videos, it's just very interesting of like, A, even for me, like how did they get here um, with kind of the ideas and all the creative thinking required? I mean, it's interesting you say that. We uh, A lot of the time we present concepts that really, that we believe are going to get the best results. So we push boundaries right to the edge and usually mm. get kind of brought back in by the client. So even, you know, we've had, we've had some weird ideas, basically. We've presented concepts <laughs> where a company wants to demonstrate that they're good for the planet and don't chuck litter in the ocean and stuff. And we had this concept where we were going to punch a dolphin in the face to show like that's not what they do. It's like trying to push boundaries. <laughs> they didn't go with that. But showing if we have, once we can communicate the reason why we're doing something, because we know that's going to be something that's going to get everyone talking and you know, it's got a creative way of really hitting a point home. Yeah. That's what we want to go for. But yeah, we do get kind of pulled back quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, and as you're talking, something that even just comes to my mind is it's a lot easier to do the old approach, quote unquote, just to like, all right, let's list the features, benefits. And usually the benefits are not even like that much different than features or like kind of intertwined. And it's just easier and quicker to do that than to really kind of press some, you know, thinking. I, and I hate to say that, but I just think people don't like to think. They may not like say that out loud, but it's like if I can use a heuristic or I can use some shortcut to just get this done out the door, then marketing should do its job rather than realizing that like to make marketing do its job, you need to be different from the start or aim. Yeah. For. And I think I think like something and uh, something that a lot of brands don't think about an added benefit of doing the approach that we're talking about is Yes, it works in terms of driving sales, but also the other approach could work. But what this approach does is it also builds positive sentiment towards your brand. So like the amount of, we, we've, we've run comment, um, campaigns for some of the biggest brands in the world. And um, like the, co the feedback in the comments is like, like, this is amazing. We love this. We love what you're doing rather than on other ads you see. It's like, oh, stop, stop trying to sell me stuff. Go away. So you, you're, you're driving that organic engagement and community with your audience as well as selling them stuff. It's like the best of both mm -hmm. worlds. Yeah, I mean, I would argue the other uh, ads most likely don't even have comments just because mm. there's nothing engaging with it. Like, mm. why am I going to comment? So yeah, no, that's a really, really good point um, as well. And yeah, I think it just really stems back from this, uh, like I said, different. I think that's key in all of marketing. Now, you might take that a step further and go kind of crazy different. But like, <laughs> if you're not different, because think about it, like we see so many ads every day, we see all these things. And I think for us, um, humans like it's you need you need some big thing to kind of catch you and like draw you out so you see someone punching like a elephant to start like a show like boom i'm yeah. interested yeah. like, why are they punching this dolphin like, why are they <laughs> yeah. so i think that's that's key to like even just getting people to care is you have to be different today because there's so much x y and z so much content yeah. so many ads all something that. i always say is like if your marketing looks like everyone else is in your industry you're doing something wrong because how how are you going to stand out if you and so many companies just do the bulk standard marketing and don't know why it's not performing or outperforming their competitors. It's because it's just a carbon cutout of what everyone else in your industry is doing. So if you're as like an action, just look at your competitors or the industry leaders, look at what they're doing. Are you just doing the same, but maybe slightly worse or not? <laughs> um, and then you can start to see, you know, what you could be doing differently. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's huge. Um, with writing content, so content, written content, one thing you can do that I've read is on your website or wherever, just block out your image or your logo in a sense and read it. And most times, um, most companies' websites all read the same. Yeah. So that that like that's a that's a practical way to pretty much do what you're saying because I can see a lot of people, you know, somewhat looking at their market. No, we're different. Like my baby's cuter than <laughs> theirs, and it's like <laughs> let's really get objective here and put like all these babies <laughs> hidden without yeah. like in. 
pick which one's cuter and you probably won't pick yours but uh yeah no that's a huge that's a really good tip and, i mean my and baby's just, definitely the cutest so yeah always right <laughs> always <classic>. always uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is what is so that's a strong held belief what is uh going to the other spectrum what's like a pet peeve what is something you just hate in marketing or you see their marketers do it or people who aren't mm. marketers who think they're marketers like is there any pet peeves that come i to think mind? any kind of lazy marketing i think i i don't want to like um criticize i think we're all learning at the end of the day so some a lot of the things i was doing when i started in the marketing space i was less educated i had less experience so i was trying lots of different things so i don't i don't want to like criticize people who aren't doing something that i think is the best approach however anything where people haven't taken the time and are trying to like fast track like i mentioned earlier just sending a load of automated messages on linkedin to say hey i noticed your company does the xyz let's have a chat it's just completely lazy and damaging to your brand and the amount of people that still do that i think is crazy that i guess that a lot of people are just going for the numbers game you know send a thousand automated messages and one or two pe people may book in a call with you but yeah that's something that's quite i find quite frustrating because i think all of our time is is precious right so spending the time opening a message that you think could be a, a genuine message oh it's an automated thing that they've done to try and save them time i i just instantly disconnect and block people who do that <laughs> yeah for real i mean that gets to the heart of being different you can't be different or be kind of you know creative if you're not uh being some if you're lazy in a sense so i think that's a that's a good way to tie it back of you know lazy marketers or lazy people essentially just take the route that has a less fr least friction which usually isn't the creative route it's not doing something different out of the box when you're doing an ad it's like we're just going to do the typical xyz format um, yeah not really and i think, think we've like we just recorded a podcast last week which isn't released yet but it was about unscalable marketing and the power of doing unscalable things when it comes to marketing some of our biggest most lucrative clients has, have come from us doing things that don't seem efficient at the time and i think as marketers we're constantly trying to automate everything and save time and use these tools that are going to help us whereas you know we, we you know going the extra mile going to um traveling hours away to meet someone and go to their event because you want to build a relationship with them and support them and buy their books and all these things like relationship building activities or sending them a handwritten note to say how grateful you are for them doing something it's these things that don't seem scalable that actually form the deepest connections that result in the best uh, outcomes so i think we need to get out of this approach as marketers of just trying to over automate and over make everything too efficient it's yeah that frustrates me <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah i think marketers have this uh weird and probably incorrect fascination with uh, efficiency with kind of automation where i do think especially early in marketing you could call it early in a company's life form or just a company's been a long a, like alive for a while but they just haven't had marketing i feel from that point like the unscalable activities are actually the only way you you gain traction like you just start a podcast like don't, you know, create a million clips of it or whatever, like just DM 17 people that you think would enjoy it and be like, Hey, I make a podcast about XYZ. I think you're in this space. So I think you'd enjoy it. And that's unscalable, but like, you're much more likely to get your first 10 listeners, your first a hundred yeah. unscalable through and kind I, of the scaled approach. I think it's, um, it's scary at first because not scary, but like it, it's most people don't want to do it because it actually makes, t um, takes effort i think everyone <laughs> nowadays wants kind of instant gratification and wants to instantly get the reward for the time they put in whereas those kind of things you need to do them and then wait for a long time before you start seeing results so it's yeah it's it's worthwhile doing but it does take longer <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to have a strong goal or what you're uh, really trying to do it for to sustain that effort uh, as the results don't come super quick through the unscalable. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. So you have a uh, weekly newsletter called the Friday Club. I saw you took it to LinkedIn, but I'm not going to ask anything kind of about that is usually uh, LinkedIn newsletters suck. But um, like what? Why did you start that? You, I think three years ago, you've been running it for three years. Like, what was the impetus? What was the reason for why you started writing that newsletter? The honest reason originally was because uh, we wanted to take ownership of 
um, how we could share information with our audience. Like with social platforms, you're relying on an, an external algorithm to serve your content to the people you want to serve it to. Whereas with email, it's the most direct approach to people saying, I want to see what these guys say and we can directly send them information or emails. So that was the original idea. And I think I want, I also wanted to flip or we wanted to flip the traditional email newsletter on its head because a lot of the email newsletters I signed up for were like spammy and just like buy our stuff, look at what we've got on offer. And I really wanted to create something that people actually got excited to open. So really had to try and think about or change the way we think about writing emails to think what would someone actually enjoy opening and you know, I really enjoy writing them now. We, we try and share a um, uh, kind of an unfiltered insight into what we're learning whilst growing a business and, and also share valuable stuff like the best content we've consumed and created each week, apps, tools, um, reports, you know, podcasts, videos, the whole lot. So I really enjoy writing mm -hmm. it and it's something I've enjoyed doing every week for the last 80 odd, not 80 weeks. It's been 80 weeks. Yeah, it must be 83. I think we're on now. Wow. Yeah. No, I like that original kind of owning. I mean, all these people that I follow talk about that, right? Email. That, that's kind of the, the holy grail of marketing because then you can kind of quote unquote control. Now Gmail can pull their stops and stuff, mm -hmm. but like most times you can directly get to people rather than relying on rented land. So I really enjoyed that. So you, you just throughout this kind of podcast, I've been hearing a little bit of like you kind of building in public, you kind of doing your work in public with your brother, with kind of showing the insides of your business. Like not everybody's doing that. Like most people are pretty like sealed off. Like we're not going to share a ton of our secrets, mm -hmm. our strategy, whatever. Why are you different? Like what was it that made you realize like, hey, we should start sharing mm -hmm. our wins, our losses and all this? Like was there a moment? Was it a gradual um, it's interesting you say that. I think when, uh, like our dad's been in business for a long time and he was a original kind of mentor of ours and he's a kind of, uh, quite a traditional businessman. And when we first started uh, thinking about producing content that would share our ideas and our secrets and give everything away, he was like, whoa, no, you can't do that because then how are you going to get customers? And we were like, no, 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 let's, I think early doors we were, religiously following Gary V and everything he said, like this is like seven years ago and read his book, Jab, 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 Right Hook. And that really changed the way that I thought about marketing and was like, give everything away. And we tried it and it started to work. So we were like, ah, this is a good approach. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that was originally, I think, haven't followed, like kind of still follow what he does and now and again but not so religiously but um that was really useful early on wow. i think that was the main kind of reason for for doing that and then i've just seen the benefits since then have seen the benefits of of not just attracting new clients but everyone that comes to us says um i feel like i know you we are f we fully get what you do let's just discuss how we can work together rather than like I said before, us putting the effort of trying to convince people mm. to work with us. They've all, we've already done all the convincing through our marketing. That final touch point is just let's figure out how we can do this. Yeah, making making the sales process a lot easier. Mm. I like that. I like that a lot. So um, just to take off to another thing that you guys are doing mm. within your uh, company. You guys created recently a marketing communications guide. You kind of posted some content on that, kind of about the why, but like, why did you create it? And then obviously like, what is it? Or uh, kind of what does yeah, it Yeah, so um, that, we noticed that as our team's been growing, we're a team of 12 now, um, with lots of different wow. people in the team and uh, voices and tone of voice, we noticed that our kind of voice to the outside world was inconsistent you know, the copy on our website to the posts we were creating to the videos we were creating. So we wanted to, and we asked ourselves, why is that? And it's purely down to us because we haven't set any guidance for this. So mm. we got to work creating a kind of guide that set out um, our tone of voice and how we want to come across and our kind of brand personality and, and what all of all the boxes that our content should tick before we hit publish so that anyone in our company who is communicating with the outside world, not just through our content, but it could be, you know, speaking to actors or people who they're trying to hire locations from or potential customers or current customers, any kind of communication. We now have like a, 
a step-by-step guide that everyone can look at to know how they should be coming across. And I think like everything in our business, we're constantly learning by just making mistakes and realizing, oh, that wasn't working. What should we do about it? And the guide was the next solution to our latest problem. (laughs) (laughs) I like that a lot. Was there any companies or anybody that does this that you kind of, you know, that inspired you or was it a real from scratch type kind of project where you didn't know? Yeah, I'll be honest. I don't, we didn't see someone else do it or i'm sure everyone had like most companies will have this we just hadn't didn't have one i think it it did come from the sort of problem of oh that's not consistent with that and that's not consistent with that let's kind of think of a solution and then Hmm. that's how we made it yeah yeah because i I mean i i do think there's probably a lot of companies with some internal document but i also think just from reading a lot of content or a lot of like sometimes you get what you're talking about where it's the same company but it just feels different or whatever so i do think that's really critical because you can say whatever about your company in some you know all hands meeting but really you know it comes from having some sort of quote-unquote guardrail some document you can use Mm. to say hey we have to play within these confines and sound this way we're never going to do this, this or this, and we're going to communicate this way. I think that's really smart and helps marketing across the board in a company. Yeah. And I think we're, as we, you know, when it was just my co-founder and brother and I, we didn't have all these challenges because we didn't hire anyone and we didn't have other people. It was just us and our tone of voice was the way we spoke or whatever. So (laughs) I think as we're growing, we're constantly finding new challenges that we're having to figure out. (laughs) And that's, this this is one of them. So... Yeah, that's uh, probably kind of just essential to running a business is having new challenges, especially if it's your first kind of go around it. Mm. You don't have these communication guides from other companies like, oh, and I ran this other company. So yeah, no, that's good. And I think the cool thing with working in public is you can essentially help. Let's just say I create a company in three years. You could have essentially helped me avoid that problem by me reading about it through you. So I think that's a very non like business ROI of working in public, building in public, but a huge just like world ROI positive of like, we can just make the world better by sharing yeah. what's going on. And, and, and as we've grown, I think when we started, just our primary objective originally was to survive and make enough money to like <laughs> survive. Yeah. But as we've obviously grown and developed, we've now just developed our positive impact plan, which is a plan which is still, we're still developing it, but we've got the kind of main structure there of how the impact we want to have on not just our customers and our customers' customers, but our t- internal team, the local community, the outside mm-hmm. world, the planet. And now we're trying to have this kind of holistic approach to what can we do to make sure we have the biggest positive impact on everything and focus on on that rather than just our original thing of let's try and make some money. Now we're actually, um, yeah, trying to think bigger picture. Yeah, no, I like that. It's it's probably quicker than most organizations you guys have of making that because obviously you have to start with a for-profit heavy mindset. Um, but there is that point or there should be that point where you kind of flip from that model to saying, hey, Patagonia, how can we start to do good for the world? Uh, because we're making all this money or whatever. So that's cool that you guys are starting to get to that point already, just starting to figure out like, how do we leave a better footprint than kind of like before? Yeah. Us. And we've definitely got a huge way to go. Like we're not suddenly the best <laughs> company ever that's amazing at this. We're just starting that journey really. So, sure. um, but it's nice to know that we are, focusing on more than just profit obviously profit is still important for us to be a sustainable business but that's one of the variety of things we're focusing on now yeah definitely yeah you need that to just uh, keep the lights on and keep the computers running so yeah definitely Awesome, man. Well, I think this is a good time to jump into our three final questions. The first two will be on marketing. The last one will be a little bit off just so you have that uh, heads up. So first question, what is one thing, and you might have already discussed it on the podcast, but what is one thing you've changed your mind on in regards to marketing in the past one, two, three, four years? So for me, I used to eat Gary Vee's content model. Now I'm like quality over quantity. What's that for you? Uh, I would say um, it's not so much a strategy, but I know I mentioned it before, but TikTok, I think when I first heard marketers talking about TikTok's the next big thing or musically, and I looked at it (laughs) and it's like a load of kids dancing, I thought, yeah, not sure about this one. But then um, it's definitely changed my mind when I saw more of 
uh, more people moving to that platform and more more people's attention moving to that platform. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And we definitely touched on that uh, significantly mm-hmm. in this one, that that change. So it's a good answer. Second question, there's a movie called Inception, whether you've watched or not, uh, the synopsis. So you can make sense of this question is people go into each other's dreams, they incept ideas, that person wakes up the next day, and it's my idea. Mm-hmm. I believe it's my idea to sell the company, whatever. So if you if I gave you the power to go in the minds of every marketer on this mm-hmm. planet and incept one idea, so tomorrow they wake up and that idea you incept is their idea they act it out they believe it what idea are you incepting in the minds of every marketer the idea that the most important thing is to produce marketing campaigns and strategies that serve the customer first before the brand or the product that would be the idea Hmm. the world would be a better place Yeah, yeah, I'd love to see all the ads that would be created with that uh, mindset. That's great. That's great. All right, final question. What is one thing outside of business and marketing that you do that then when you come to do business and marketing, you're able to do it better? So for me, that's a walk after lunch. Every day I go for a 30 minute stroll. And then when I come back to work, I can be better. What is that for you? Mine's similar ish, I guess, any kind of exercise. And I like to play squash and go to the gym. And after doing those things, I feel like I work a lot more efficiently and feel a lot more happy which is a good thing. <laughs> Definitely. Squash. Can you, uh, what is that? I've oh, uh, never um, heard of it. It's like you're in a court with a small ball with kind of sort of elongated tennis rackets and you hit a ball against the wall. Okay. Have you heard of that? There's, okay. Usually a glass back. I think we, it usually has a glass back. Yeah. I, th- I don't, I'm trying to think like we might call it cause I'm obviously in the United States. Uh, we might call it like pick pickleball oh, okay. or something. Cool. I don't know, but I am getting what you're saying because at my local YMCA, there's like these glass rooms and there's people yeah. just slapping yeah, balls it. off it and getting intense and I have no clue what's yeah. happening. I'm always like, it's uh, indoor tennis. Like, what <laughs> that's are they a good doing? way of describing you know? it, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> that's cool, man. Yeah, I I've, I've found many people use some form of exercise to just like unplug their mind from work stuff and allow like kind of answers almost to just rise to the surface in our brain as if we focus on work. 24 seven, like you're just never going to be able to come up with creative ideas or think outside yeah, the box. Yeah, I totally agree. It gives you a good break from, from working and stop thinking about things to do with work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's, um, if you want to get like super kind of like technical, it's probably actually like dopamine or certain things released during yes. working out. So it definitely feels good. It's not just carrying like a, yeah, it's not like a toad leg in the sock here to like be more creative. Like there's probably actual back yeah. science to it. But... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, Dan. All right. This is kind of, you've talked a lot about some things you do, your podcast newsletter. This is kind of the final kind of play segment in the show where you just share everything you want to uh, plug in that okay. sense. You know, the, the time is yours. So just share and anything you say here, I'll keep in the the podcast notes. Link cool. To. Okay. I'd say just a few things. We've mentioned the Business Anchors podcast. It's where my co-founder and I, who's also my brother, sit down and talk about all the things we're learning whilst growing our agency and our marketing business. Uh, So yeah, go give that a listen. Also, The Friday Club, which is our weekly email newsletter that I write and send every week with all the best content we've consumed and created each week. And on social media, I guess, if you want to follow our, we're on TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, the whole kind of lot. Follow Knowlton or me personally, Dan Knowlton as well. Awesome, man. Definitely. We'll uh, include all those links on there. I'll have to like create a TikTok account just to go get the you TikTok link. But uh, I know, I know you're the second to third person that I've interviewed recently that has like been TikTok's it, TikTok's it. So I'm kind of like almost now just that old grumpy man who won't do it because everybody's telling me do you to know do what's, it. No, what's interesting, e- let's say you even hate TikTok. Some of our most effective videos on other platforms like LinkedIn are TikTok videos. So you know, even if you don't want to be on TikTok, you can repurpose the content on other platforms (laughs) and it can do well. Yeah, that's actually what I've heard. Uh, Funny enough, someone said the exact same thing. So yeah, definitely at minimum use it for repurposing uh, as it can do a little better on LinkedIn was the platform the guy was talking about. So that's interesting to have two people validate it. But hey, Dan, I appreciate you coming on the show. And I appreciate you kind of giving me some knowledge, giving me some wisdom that I uh, will apply to my career and life. So thank you. No worries. Thanks for having me. This is the end of the podcast.